All right. What's up, everybody? What the hell is going on? Hey, uh, just before we start, um, I want to get like a, a quick um, thumbs up, a thumbs down from you guys to make sure that the audio levers are okay. So, um, Glocko, go ahead and say some some words. Yes. <laughs> What's up, guys? How are you doing? Uh, awesome. Testing, testing. This is going to be the volume that I'll be speaking. That's it. That's it. Perfect. Okay. Yo, yo, yo. How does the sound sound to everybody? The levels are okay. I'm not too loud. He's not too loud. The fan in the background's not too loud. Audio's fine. Sweet. <laughs> Watch everything crash now. All right? Like, all right, everything looks good. Sh done all right okay i think we're uh so we'll um maybe a little louder for glauco brennan's a little bit louder than glauco okay i'll turn me down <laughs> that's um, not saying anything about your personality though <laughs> all right please. all right how does that so mine mine should be a little bit lower does that does that sound good Gawko, can you say something again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, testing. I'm going to be speaking. La, 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 la. All right. That should you be okay. You want me to sing? I can sing. Oh, dude. Things. you Wait, you can sing too? Oh, my God. Dude, we don't have a chance, man. We don't have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, cool. So, it seems like uh, audio levels are okay. So, um... Yeah, I think we'll um, we'll wait for maybe uh, just a couple quick minutes here and just kind of hang out for a couple minutes, uh, wait for kind of people to filter in, and then uh, we'll start this shindig. So what's up, Glocko? All right. Uh, not much, man, not much. How you doing? How's life? Like a beautiful Saturday. I just came back from my morning run. I did like 100... Push-ups, 100 squats, 100. Just getting the day started, and I'm ready to do this amazing live stream with this amazing guy called Brandon. Ah! <laughs> Wait, so you, all this, and you can find time to exercise too? My God, dude! Oh yes. I actually use it. Oh, yeah, it only takes like it only takes about like 30, 45 minutes a day. So yeah, that's true. That's true. All right. All right. Fair enough, dude. Fair enough. I did take my daughter for a walk this morning, so that was kind of my thing. That was fun. All right. Um, let's get this shindig started. So now that we've got the sound test out of the way, um, this, my friends and fellows, is Glauco Longi. Glauco! What the hell's going on, buddy? Ah! <laughs> Uh, Glauco, in case, um, in case there's one person in the crowd that, uh, may not know who Glauco Longi is, uh, he is a, uh, 3D character artist in the video game industry, and, um, as of late, his, uh, latest release has been work on Uncharted 4 at a little company called Naughty Dog, in case you guys haven't heard of Naughty Dog. Yeah, so that's, um, so that's Glauco. Awesome. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, links in chat if you guys uh, want to see some of his other work. Uh, we've got his website, we've got his art station, um, and some other fun stuff. So, Glauco, how the hell are you, buddy? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> for the introduction. I'm also... You want me to talk a little bit? Yeah, about yeah, yeah, yeah. Give yourself... Uh, now that I gave you, like, you know, the the opening introduction you can fill in all the rest of the holes <laughs> all right so i started my career as a video editor about 10 years ago and i was basically the editing doing like advertising editing and doing some motion graphics stuff and then i discovered 3d modeling and 3d animation in general and then i started studying that at that time i was still in college I, I was doing my major in movies, in like film, like in a film school. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And then after like two, three years working in the advertising studios and doing like 3D modeling and like focusing on characters and doing like some freelance as well, my passion for traditional sculpture became like so high that I kind of not gave up, but I kind of decided to move 100% or maybe like 90% into traditional sculpture in like traditional practical effects. Mm. So I basically studied like two, three years and then I opened my own studio, run that for like two years, uh, actually three years and a half. So I run my own studio, was like teaching classes, doing like traditional makeup and like working for films and moves and stuff. That's awesome. And then on 2013, I came, I, I came to the US to visit a bunch of traditional and practical effects studios to kind of try to find a job because I always wanted to come to California since I was a kid because I was since I was like 10 or 12 I was skateboarding and like I was living this uh, hardcore and skateboarding uh, culture so I always wanted to come here and then uh, and then I came here do I did a bunch of course uh, along these years, but in 2013, I came, visited a bunch of studios, and then I visited Naughty Dog and also visit other video game company studios. <laughs> and I decided to do this. So I saw an opportunity and I kind of a gap. And so basically, what I was doing, it was doing great in Brazil, but I wouldn't be able to move to California to do what I was doing at that time, which was traditional sculpture and mm -hmm. practical effects, because there's a lot of people doing this kind of stuff here already. Right. So I saw this gap and I saw this need for really amazing character artists. And then I, I, I thought to myself, maybe I can utilize all, all the 3D modeling that I know and kind of put together with all the traditional uh, skills that I got during these years mm -hmm. and maybe I can switch back over to digital right and then that's what I did I I went back to Brazil closed my studio and then I basically started building my old port my uh, like a new portfolio focus on characters and really 100% focus on audio dog wow and I'm glad that worked out because I got hired and then I they brought me over me and my wife to California, and then I started working at Naughty Dog on January 2015, Dude. like one year and six months ago, and then I got straight into Uncharted 4, and then that's pretty much it, like 10 years and five minutes. Sorry, I'm turning my fan off real quick. A little too loud. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. Um, so, like, when when you were um, putting together your portfolio, you were mm -hmm. specifically targeting Naughty Dog? Yeah. That's awesome. And then you landed it. You're like, whew. Ah. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. Big move, because, like I said, I was running my own studio in Brazil, and the studio was growing. And, yeah. And I had, like, 40, 50 students at that time. And also, like, a big, some big films and, like, big commercials going on. Yeah. And then, of course, I finished all the work that I was doing, but I kind of started rejecting work. And also, I closed the studio. Right. And every, everyone was like, dude, you are... What are you doing? Insane. What are you doing there? <laughs> everything, yeah, everything is doing so great and stuff. But I kind of had this belief that I, I was going uh, I was gonna be able to achieve what I was trying to do. Right, and I'm glad things worked out that well. Yeah, I know, right? You're like, when you finally got the ex uh, the acceptance letter, you're like, oh, whew. <laughs> yeah. And then after that, there is a visa process. Right? Oh, I know, right? So basically, I got hired. Yeah, so basically, I got hired, but it's like, like, all right, you are hired only if you can get a visa. And of course, they do all the paperwork. They have like amazing lawyers and stuff. Right. But. Yeah. <laughs> but there's still like, yeah. Oh my God! Now uh, I have to prove to the U.S. that I'm good enough to to be here. And of course, right. that that went that went super smooth and like was oh. pretty easy for me. But, so this goes to show everybody else too. Like I we have a lot of uh, international people that uh, that hang out uh, on my streams. So and a lot of I get a lot of these questions too of like you know well, what does it take to get into America to to work in the industry there and like. 
you know, there, there's a lot of different answers and stuff, but j- hearing that from you, like, and knowing what you've been through and, and where you've come from and where you are now, like, that's, it's incredible to hear that, like, it is possible, you know, just, you just have to be a, a badass artist, right? Like, you just work on your art, work, work, yeah, work yeah, on your yeah. art. So, exactly, that's what I always tell people is, uh, unfortunately, you are not American, so there's nothing that you can do about that. The only mm-hmm. thing you can do is, like, get good enough to a company uh think that it's that they need you here and they like create this necessary necess- this this uh <laughs> necessary this this thing that yeah, yeah they, they yeah. want to hire you so you, you gotta be good enough that's that's the only thing i always right. tell people and, that, and it's kind no, of a blessing and a curse else you can do yeah i mean it's kind of a blessing yeah. and a curse right it's like your art works for you but it can also work against you if it's not quite good enough, you know. Like if you just focus on your art and making awesome art and getting out there for people to see, like that's the biggest thing, right? Yeah, it's it's you against yourself. Yeah, right. Right, like during like the during this all this time and after even after you, you get a job, it's you gotta keep pushing forward to keep like evolving and developing your skills. So right, staying uh, relevant, like, right? Uh, yeah. Awesome. All right. So, uh, so what uh, what are you gonna do with us today? So uh, we were talking about um, going through your character pipeline in kind of um, a general sense, and then probably doing some uh, marmoset stuff. Yeah. So I want to show you guys. So this is my latest personal project, and one thing that I always get tons of. E- email and message about is how I set up my skin, my skin shader and how I set up my textures, how I set up like hair and eyes and all, all this stuff in Marmoset. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to go over through this project and then I'm going to re-import the head and the eyes and like the eyebrows, the hair and everything, everything back. Like I'm going to start from scratch, building up all the shaders and materials. I think this is something I haven't seen people doing before and I also get a lot of emails asking me this kind of stuff so yeah we whenever you're ready we yeah can dude just that. just uh, just kick ass man go do it <laughs> all right so and I have the chat around here and I'm, I'm sure you, you also have like your, your all your moderators like yeah to see questions so yep I'm just gonna tell people that if they want to ask something just go ahead and ask. I'm gonna okay. try to answer as much as I can. And okay. Yeah, and all. I'm, why I'm doing this? I'm I'm here to help <laughs> and to share a little bit of my knowledge. So just feel free to ask. Awesome. Oh, I got and a couple. Even if it's not related to what I'm doing, sure, you can ask too. Cool. All right. I I got a couple um already coming in. So, um, I'll just start start feeding them to you whenever you're ready. Yeah. Yeah. Just just go for it. Okay. That's fine. Uh, so the first question comes in, um, how do you go about starting to learn hand painting skin textures? Uh, and well, what's your general workflow for yeah, skin kinda, textures? So that's a kind of a tricky one because the way I paint my skin textures, I'm going to show you guys in substance in a second. But the way I paint, it's because I learned how to paint this way doing traditional like latex masks and silicone painting. So I... I utilize the same techniques from the traditional in the, into the digital. You don't have to do that. This is just the way I do it because I think it's easier for me to understand and how how I like distribute all the colors into the skin. But I'm gonna go over a little bit and at least show all my layers and stuff. But cool. it's hard. I mean, if you wanna learn how to do that. There's a website called Stan Winston School. Stan have, Winston like, is awesome. And... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're the best. And they they have at at the time I was starting and I was learning, there was no Stan Winston school or no <laughs> other, or other sites talking about that. So it was like really, really hard. But anyway, so nowadays there's like these guys and they are just showing and sharing like how they did all those movies and like real artists telling like real uh, real stuff. It's not like made up stuff. Right. 
So usually you. Uh, all right, let me just restart something here. Just a second. So while that's restarting, so um, it's comforting to know that yeah. a lot of the techniques that people use in traditional makeup and effects still hold true when you're doing digital um, effects, correct? Yep. Yeah. That's awesome to know. So, like, if, um, because I, I was actually doing some, um, Stan Winston, uh, workshop online, uh, tutorials and stuff, and the amount of, of, uh, the amount of knowledge that they have, uh, going into that whole project is crazy. It's crazy good. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. So they are, they, they basically call like, oh, you work on Jurassic Park or something like that under the Stan Winston. So just go here, they record this video. <laughs> and then the guy showing how he painted all the dinosaurs. So it's, it's crazy. Dude, it's just like the best thing ever. Yeah. yeah it's, it's the same like nowadays what we're trying to do with the digital artists as well. So, oh, you're working on Uncharted, you're working on that project, on this game. How did you do that? And then yeah. that's pretty much it. <clears throat> Yeah, so no, no secret here. What what I usually do on ZBrush is like pretty much what everyone else is doing as well. So I start with like a DynaMesh, and then I kind of rough out all all my mesh. Let me see. Let me just see if I have like early versions of that guy. Okay. So it's easier to show. Uh, yeah, I do have. All right. So basically, this guy started with. Uh, a base mesh that I have, like the simple base mesh that everyone you kind of use. Mm -hmm. And then I block out some of the anatomy, just like rough out. So I'm going to import just a few, so I think it's easier to show. This is like my true process. It's not like something that I kind of made up to right. show. So I was just blocking some accessories and trying to to see what I was going for. I, I was following like some concepts, but not something strict. So I kind of... I wanted to have my own identity to it as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not like something 100% based on on a concept. Right. Then like the head started, started to look like a head. And of course for the head, I'm using like some Iggy Pop references and like- <laughs> Iggy stuff. Pop, that's a great reference, man. <laughs> yeah. Then I was starting to block the back working on the hands a little bit and like the torso trying to understand how I'm going to show this rib cage without without looking like uh, a zombie I mm -hmm. didn't want to go for like the zombie but now the proportions are off a little bit but I'm going to work on that later and then let me see this one here you can see like how the proportions change a lot yeah. from this one to this one then i started blocking some accessories mm -hmm. and some of this stuff i did 100 percent zbrush and some other stuff i kind of did like a rough block out here mm -hmm. and then i brought that to maya and kind of did a retopo and some right stuff like this jar and like this uh these belts and this kind of stuff i do 100 percent in maya it just brings to zbrush to kind of detail yeah a lot of times it's um to play with this yeah, so for specific things, it's a lot yeah. easier to do in like um in like a core program like Maya or Max or Moto, than it is to like try to do it in ZBrush. Yeah, exactly. And then, right. Coming along. And that's nice. much it. I'm, yeah, I'm like adding a bunch of accessories, and mm -hmm. this guy is pretty much done i think by oh it's not so it's still very rough i think i kind of hit a wall mm -hmm. like on the body so i decided to keep moving forward with the accessories and all right i'm gonna come back later to finish the body and then uh, it was probably one of the, the latest things oh man look at, look how many sub tools you have i'm I, i'm not crazy by having a ton of sub tools thank you <laughs> now, now now that i know that like you do it too <laughs> no. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's no other way around it, unfortunately. I, I kind of, 
they know it. I already told them, but I don't like it at all. And I'm like super organized with everything. Mm -hmm. So when I'm going to show you guys in Maya, I have like layers, send it up, like all the objects and everything. But here's like a really crazy mess. <laughs> right. Whatever. So, all right, this one is very heavy. Yeah. And by the way, I, I don't have like a super machine at, at home. Because, <laughs> yeah, I don't need it. But I can show you guys like the torso. So, okay, so this, this file, I split up the torso, the arms, and the head. Mm. And then in the end, I had one object for each for one UV. Because as far as I know, Marmoset doesn't work, doesn't deal with... Uh, multiple UVs, so right. they didn't split into different UVs. So this is like torso finish. So how many UV sets did you have on this guy when you were done? Uh, I think probably six or seven. Six or seven. And then did you do 2K maps for each one of those? Uh, we can see here. No, it's I think 1K map. 1K. So I have... One, two, three. I don't know what the fuck's that. Four, <laughs> five, <laughs> six. Oh, no, no, this is just one, so five. Uh, six, seven, eight for the head, nine for the eyes, and ten for the hair. So ten. Four. Holy cow! Yeah. So is that um, so for yeah, s like some of the um, the higher end models in game are are you usually around that many um, that many UV sets or is it usually a little bit uh, less than that? Uh, if, if the, it really it really depends on the importance of the character, but yeah. we can definitely go over over it if we need in a production. Right. But I would say I'm def I I would I can definitely optimize this a little bit, but if I so it's kind of you, you gotta choose between having bigger maps yeah. or, or or like more UV sets, right? Right. So uh, yeah, I, I can definitely optimize this a little bit. You can see like even like the topology for some of these parts are like. Dynamesh and like decimated parts right. because I didn't want to spend the time doing that. There's like no purpose of doing that. <laughs> right, exactly. Time, since I do that at work. Like, every right. Day. And that but, just goes to show everybody else too that like, you know, uh, if if it's not going to be in an actual production uh, and you're making just a, a portfolio piece, right? Like not every single piece has to be exactly perfect, right? It's all about the final outcome and what the final outcome looks like, yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, so if you were applying, if you're not working in the industry, you don't have a lot of experience and you are applying for a company and you only, you're only showing like this mated meshes. I don't think this is uh, like the perfect situation, the perfect thing for you to do. Right. At least show one or two models and show them that you can definitely do and understand topology and you can really know how to optimize stuff and how right. to lay down proper fees and everything. But if you are already working, if you don't if you already have pieces showing that you can do that, just use your time like the best way possible. Right. So I don't have a lot of free time. So I don't want to spend this amount of free time that I have showing something that people know that I can already do. I right, exactly. I spend my time doing like, artistic uh, decisions. And right. Stuff. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah, that zebra yeah. sculpt looks awesome, man. Oh, thanks, man. So, yeah, so that's pretty much it, like how I do everything in ZBrush. And, of course, at this time, all my meshes already had not all of them, but some of them already had UVs. But anyways, I don't bake any uh, normals in ZBrush anymore. So I'm going to close the ZBrush just because mm -hmm. 
uh, if I open Substance Spinner, my computer will <laughs> <It'll> melt down. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm, I'm gonna close Marmo Set too. Okay. As well. I'm gonna keep my open. I can just minimize this. And I'm gonna open Substance Spinner. Mm. So I do all my bakes and everything in Substance Spinner. Oh, let me show, just show the Maya first. Yeah. So basically, what I have in Maya, uh, I have all these final meshes. So some of the meshes, some of like the buttons, for example, I do have them in the high poly because I wanted to have like the silhouette change. Right. But like this really small one here, they don't they don't show like in the they're not in the low poly. They're just like project. Right. Based. Right. And then I can poly paint and, and then have I get the same for this guy as well. Right. Even though it's like all decimated, at least I try to uh, utilize the UV space as much as I can. So keeping separate meshes would increase the poly count. And, right. And so on. So do you do all your yeah, like your and UV? One and... thing that I... Sorry, go ahead. In Maya. Yeah. I do all my UV in Maya. Okay, okay. I can show you guys here. Mm, UVs. So yeah, so like I was saying, I was trying to uh, optimize or at least do this properly. So this is like beautiful laid down, but like this looks bad. Doesn't look good. <laughs> like the geometry. Right. But whatever. Yeah, if it works, it works though, right? You can see like all. Yeah, you can see like all the pieces kind of. So all the metal bits and like all the leather, they are all all concentrated in one part of the mesh, and then. The same here with these guys, these guys here, and like torso. I was planning to put the arms here and split the hands and the arms, but in the end, I kind of kept the arms separated. Mm. Oh no, I just one mesh. Yeah, that's it. Oh, so so the last one was one mesh or two, or two meshes? There are two meshes, but using one UV. But oh, okay. The same thing. Gotcha. So I'm only using one UV, so it doesn't matter. It's just we can count as just one mesh, just right. like one UV set. Right. And for the head, all right, yeah, I split like the back of the head since it's not showing in my model. I just put like a small piece here. Right. And I'm trying to utilize the most space for the head. Hmm. And of course, I started with like a good geometry, but then I was changing that so much I didn't want to do a retopo, so I just did a zero mesh using yeah. some guys. But I, I got some like weird issues going on around here and there, but like I said, whatever. Right. But I still kept like some loops on the eyes. Because I was I was planning to do like some expressions here. Mm-hmm. It was like, nah, whatever. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that I was doing here in Maya, this I can I could like come here and like delete these edges and stuff. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I was I wasn't too concerned about the poly count for this guy. Of course, I was trying to keep under uh, to make it kind of uh, real time. So I was making it enough to to render in my machine on my set. Right, but I right. Wasn't too much concern like video game topology. Right, right, right. You weren't so you weren't trying to hit six six thousand uh, polys, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So this is the hair, the eyebrows, all right. and now these guys here. So what I did, I exported each individual part with the, his own name. I don't know if you guys can do that, how how to do that, how know how to do that, but I can show you. So basically, the head mesh, I go to my shader. It's called head one, and if if I go to my uh, shader engine, it's called head two. It, I, I don't know why I called head two. I think I had like two heads at that time and I was uh, tweaking the UVs, but whatever. The name that is under the shading engine, uh -huh. it's going to be the name that's going to show in, in Substance Painter. So when I import the head here, I'm going to just open the final project so you guys can see. So basically what I did, I exported all the lows and all the highs, and then I'm going to bake everything into just one project in Substance Painter. There's a lot of like tutorials on the internet how to do that if you, if you don't know. Yeah. But yeah, let's just 
try to spend my time doing something. Yeah, else. yeah. But basically, I have like all the shape ranging names and all the texture set lists here. So Holy texture two, set so list! This is just the heaven. <laughs> yeah. And awesome. Okay. It's the same shortcut as in 3D Max for isolation. So if I hit Alt Q. Oh, uh, like what? I said I didn't even know that. Mode. What the hell? Alt Q. Got it. Come on, man. Oh, no, man. Alt Q, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I set up in Maya the same hotkey as well because I was, originally, I was a 3D Max user. Oh, okay. And that's like the 3D Max shortcut. Right. Whatever. So uh, this is like the head that we're going to work on right now. And basically, this is 95% hand painted. I say 95% because there's still some photographs and some like high details on like around the forehead. And some, I think I projected a nose. It doesn't show here anymore, but I started mm -hmm. with like a projected nose and probably like projected cheeks just to kind of uh, make my life easier on, right. on, on, on the coloring. To so get like a, a base color down? So, yeah, a base color down. And then I hand painted everything on top. Probably like this area here. Uh huh. And like the nose. I'm not sure. We can try to see. So uh, just a quick uh, question quick question for you. Sure. Um when you when you did uh, the initial high res sculpt for this guy for the face, um, did you use something like yeah. uh, texturing XYZ for um, like the pore data? Yeah. Yes. I use, so you can see here. Yeah. There's a lot of ports. And so I, I do use a mixture of techniques. Okay. This is high enough to show these details, but this is not high enough to show uh, the, the super fine details, like right. all the tertiary details. Because this is, this, this project was meant to be uh, like more a video game, like a video game pipeline instead of like a movie pipeline. Mm -hmm. So in a movie pipeline and where you can render stuff out, you can go way higher, use like high displacement maps and stuff. So this is, this wasn't like the goal for this guy. And this is the way I think maybe this way is going to change in the future. But yeah. for now, <clears throat> I think this is kind of my workflow holds enough detail for the stuff that I do. Yeah, it looks good, man. And I'm going to show... Thanks. And we're going to show, you can see like there's still some like loose areas here from like one port to the other because there's not enough texture resolution. Right. So I'm going to show one trick in Marmoset. This is a trick we use in video games as well, like projecting and tidying like a, a detail normal just to kind of have like more breakup in the specular and also in the normal map. Cool. Uh, so this is basically what I had. I actually didn't. So this is my first layer. It's just like a pure base color. I don't have any photographs here. So what I said was wrong. Anyways, I'm gonna, <laughs> I didn't use any photographs for this one. <laughs> so anyways, I'm going to just show I was talking about all the layers and how I paint in traditional media, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you guys how I do that. So this is exactly the way, the same way I do in traditional. So I would, I always start with like a fresh color, a flesh color, I mean. Right. And then I have here all my palette. This is how I approach it. So I have, of course, it's, it's showing black because the layers turn it, it's right. not turning on. So after a while, it's going to like update this. But let's just keep it off for now. So I have like all these colors, which is going to be red and green and blue and a darker red and a kind of yellowish color mm -hmm. and uh, purple and a dark green. Right. I think this is and maybe a white. And now I and then I start laying down these colors, putting all these colors, basically kind of building it up from the inside out. Uh, so so, so you I always use... start with the red. You use uh, each layer for a different color, and then you just paint that color into the locations that you want to? Yeah, exactly. So I always have like a flat color, and I'm painting the mask. Awesome. So I can always revert, and I right. can always change uh, the opacity of that layer. That's a cool so way to do it. So this is the same way I was doing traditional. So I would 
fill up my airbrush with the right. red paint and, and I would spread like paint all the stuff and then I would change that to yellow and then change to uh, whatever color I want to do. So I started with the red. I'm going to go through the layers quickly just so you guys can see all the colors. So I started with the red and then I do like a darker red and then I start adding some details. I'm just, okay. So I'm adding... So you can see the first red is like a very loose red. Yeah. Like some, it's called mottling, the technique that we use on, on traditional media. But it's more like a zigzag motion and some kind of like darker spots. Mm -hmm. And then we go with like a fine, more refined in like specific areas red. And then I throw in some purple because I want it to be like, like a dead skin. Right. Kinda, uh, yeah, and then I have like a wash of like green, so you don't see that, you don't see it that much, but if I can, right, can it just it's like very subtle, shifts it a little bit, right? It's like breaking up, yeah, it shifts all the reds in some specific areas, mm. and then I have like more like a blue, bluish in some spots, and. And you're and just using like some of the uh, brushes. Wash. You're just using some of the brushes in here, right? Yeah, and just hand paint them on. Yeah, yeah. I use the. Uh, I use this dirt brush a lot, and mm -hmm. I also use this dirt two and this dirt three. And there's like another one that I always use. Oh, this mold. Mm. It's very good. Sometimes I do use this spray just to get like some uh, freckles. Right. That's awesome. I love that you're so using so like a, a traditional uh, approach. Just like, because uh, like you can tell like your background uh, in traditional um, makeup and effects is definitely like <laughs> influencing how you do it here. You're like, oh, I just, you yeah. know, I fill it with this color and then I, I put it in and then I fill it with this color and I put it in. That's, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is not the only way of doing things. It's mm -hmm. just the way I do. So, right. For me, maybe it's just because the way I kind of learn, and my kind of my mind. Even though I'm painting like a creature, for example, I don't have like the same colors, but I, my approach is always the same. It's always kind of trying to build all, building all these layers instead of painting like the final look. Right. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't work for everyone. It doesn't work for everything, but usually this is how I do. And then I have like some darker spots and like the dark spots, these kind of details, they are very important because they bring something that I usually call like sharpness to the model. So if I, if I don't do like some really fine details or you kind of, the, the model looks super loose and like super like smooth. Yeah. So when you start adding like some fine detail in some specific areas, it kind of shows, it adds like a sharpness to it. It's okay. Hard to explain. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I kind of, and then I'm kind of faking a little bit of like translucency and adding some white, which is gonna make, if you can see here, like this area, for example. If I remove the white, it's all like darker colors and when i add the light with like this all uh, this breakup yeah it kind of adds a little bit of like uh adds volume to the paint right it's just because i'm breaking with like a, a lighter color doing like this zigzag motion and then on top of that i have some purple some more purple i think it's around the eyes yeah like some veins damn and and then this was like my base color. And then on top of that, I'm gonna paint, I'm gonna start painting what I want it to look like the final look of the character. Mm -hmm. So I can add like a stubble and then I added some dirt. And then on the dirt, I ended up using some of the AO and uh, utilizing some of like the cracks on the head and right. like some deep wrinkles. And then I painted the scar. Doesn't look that good here, but once in the final model, kind of looks okay. Yeah. And then I added the blood, 
Oh, he's got to have a little blood, man. Go back to. Oh yeah. Yeah, they gotta have, add, add a little bit of that like that. specularity on there. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, I think this layer I used. Uh, I was I don't know. That was a oh, cap to generate a, a cavity map. Did you generate that out of? Um... But I don't think I. Sorry, did you generate that? No, I think I did this one here, Sutton Spinner. Oh, okay. I did this one here. Gotcha. Using like the mask builder, and like playing with the values. Right, 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 right. But I was trying this 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 map. I was trying to use to kind of remove some of the specular in some specific areas, mm. and just to kind of bring more contrast to my specular in Marvel set, but I don't think I ended up using in the final. Yeah, that's an interesting way of, of going about it too. Like if, if you feel like the shader is, um, you know, you have too much spec somewhere, like you can just go in and create your own masks to take out uh, a specific value in a, in a specific channel in certain areas. Like that's awesome. Yeah, usually what I do, I, I like to paint my glossiness map. Mm. So this is... You, you always have like that T motion on the glossiness, like the forehead and the nose and yep. a little bit on the cheeks. Yeah. And then my specular map for for, uh, for like skin is always oh, pretty much basically like a flat color. So it's just like a value. Okay. So I play with the value for the specular and then I and I change the way it's it's reacting with the roughness, with the glossiness or roughness, whatever. Interesting. And now and then I see substance painter doesn't deal with like multiple UVs. Yeah. I ended up having this layer here just trying to blame. Mm. So I was I was painting here and painting the torso, painting here, painting the torso. Oh, was, that's an uh, interesting problem too, right? Trying like to make, trying yeah, to match them is, up, right? This is like the downside. Yeah. Uh, trying to make it like seamless. But uh, yeah, I got like a in the end, pretty it's close. Not like perfect, but yeah. I think it works. Yeah. Yeah, you can't tell. Close. It's all good. Yeah. And so, then the same thing for the torso. Yeah. Right, so you did the similar similar approach to all the skin, yeah. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. So I think we can start moving to Marmoset, set, which is I really like. Yes. To do Love to see how set. your setup in Marmoset is. All right. So for the skin for the um, for the torso, it's all hand painted too. Yes. Damn, that's crazy. Yeah, this one was one hundred percent hand painted. That's crazy. Yes. Do, um, right, so quick, quick question on on the skin. Um, in so in sure. engine do do um a lot of places use actual subsurface scattering um maps or do they kind of usually just fake it in game uh, uh it really depends depends on the engine and what i'm what i do in marvel set i don't have any maps controlling the subs the subs the sub scattering or the sub subsurface scattering or anything like that i just go like with values but of course, if I want to have like that ear glowing or like a specific shot mm -hmm. or like a specific angle for the camera, because what I do in Marmoset, it's more like a, uh, it's just like a way to show that I can do real time models and characters, but they're not 100% made for production because in production, we kind of cheat in production as well, cheat, I mean, mm -hmm. and so let's say for this shot, this lighting situation, we're gonna have to tweak the shade, the model a little bit, or the shader a little bit, and the textures here and there. So it all depends. Right. So it's not like one it, base, like, like one base, like oh, these are all of the um, textures. Um, the, you'll you'll actually tweak stuff almost shot to shot sometimes. Uh, no, we of course we try to do to make everything working without touching. Right. But I think it's almost impossible to hit 100% of the look and like the final look in all situations, right? 
So right. maybe in that specific cinematic shot or in the other one, we have to tweak it a little bit here and there. Right. But of course, like the major, the majority of the model and the shader works with all all the maps. Right. Right. That was like preset. Okay. So what? I'm, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. You're good. Okay. So I'm gonna export the head from Maya. I already exported that. I'm gonna open like a marble set from scratch. Cool. I'm gonna file import. And then I have this head here. And one thing to keep in mind when you're doing marble set in pretty much all shader and shading and material setup, pay attention to the scale, the scale of the scene and the scale of your models. Mm -hmm. So the way I check my scale, of course this scale is gonna work because it's the same one that I already had. But the way I I know it's working, I'm going to create a light and on the shortcut is Ctrl L, mm -hmm. but you can come here, seeing new light, and then I'm going to put this light above his head, and let's see, I'm going to tweak the intensity, I'm going to, if I'm going too fast, just... No, it should be alright, you're alright. But I'm going to... Tweak the sky just to kind of see what the light is doing. Then I'm gonna position it here, and you you, you can see like the shadows are not high resolution enough, but mm. they are not like creating any weirdness on the mesh. Uh, so I'm gonna create like a new material called skin. Put this here, change that to skin, and then. I'm gonna play with the subdermis scatter, mm -hmm. and you can see that it's going from none to a lot of scatter. So it shows me that my scale it's working. Sometimes you you tweak this value and yeah. nothing happens, or sometimes you tweak it and like a lot of stuff happens, and you only have like this this small amount to play with. So in this case, I have like a lot of room to play. So for me, the scale like the scale. Of the size of the scenes. So, a quick question and then, then like on scale. Yeah. Um, so, do you sure. only worry about scale when you get to this point, or do you, or, or when? Because in ZBrush, it's really yeah. tough to play with scale, right? Um, but then you're doing retopo exactly on the same high res mesh in Maya and doing all your V's and stuff. So, is it only at this point that you um, worry about scale, or is it before as well? So usually, since I know the scale I like to work with, mm -hmm. I kind of, if I'm starting from a base mesh, I kind of start, uh, I have this base mesh with, with, with in, which is in this same scale that I'm working right now. So if I'm starting from a base mesh or if I'm modeling anything in Maya first, mm -hmm. I'm definitely doing in this scale. This scale there, okay. But I think... Yeah, I think the model, like the arc, the other model that I did, uh -huh. I started 100% in ZBrush. Right. And then in the end, I have to rescale all my objects right. to the scale that I'm using. Here. So, but so, it's not a big deal. You can just like group everything and scale and right. whatever. So one of the, would you suggest... It's, it's not like super important. Would you suggest, um, like if you're going to do most of everything, most, most of the creation in ZBrush, would you suggest uh, creating an object... Um, so like if you're going to start with a head, but do pretty much everything in ZBrush, maybe come in and create your original sphere to the size that you want in say Maya or Max or Moto, and then export that out as your original or your, your starting point. Yeah, you can do that. Okay. Yeah, you can do that. Usually I don't like to go too technical when I'm like kind of yeah trying to just fresh out some ideas. Right. But yeah, of course, if you have like a project, you are working like more serious building up something, you can definitely do that. But cool. you can always fix this kind of stuff. So yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't pay too much attention. The, the only reason I'm mentioning this is because I get a lot of people sending me like Marmoset files. Hey, my skin looks so bad or I think <laughs> the values and nothing happened. So it's yeah. like a, Okay. So that's good like to know. Heads up. Cool. Yeah. The second thing that I always do, I go to my render settings and I turn on high resolution shadows, front, face shadows, local reflections, maybe sometimes it creates like some weird spots and of course ambient occlusion. 
and yeah, you can see like it's tweaking on on the dark on, on the shadow mm -hmm. a little bit, something like that. And yeah, that's pretty much like my base to start with. The normal smoothing I'm gonna tweak as as when I get like normal map. Right. My shadow blur I can start tweaking it right now. Maybe something like that. And what I'm trying to see here is like how the light is blending within the shadows. I want to see some some of I can change this kind of uh, gray just to kind of see it better. I want to see some red and some coloring in the transition mm. on the shadows like here and there. So if you, it's way easier to set up this beforehand before all the textures because once you have all the textures laying you don't see this effect that much right that later but, yeah. maybe something like this yeah, it's not bad and I'm gonna change this to black and I'm gonna duplicate this light just to have like another light in the scene so we can and I judge things better. Now I'm gonna have to start playing with the roughness and all the glossiness and all my values. So keep in mind that making your head black is gonna make everything way easier. So you can you can only you can focus right. on the speckler and like all the highlights. So I'm gonna import this uh, this head glossiness. Oh, that's a great way to check all the levels, man. That's genius. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Sorry. Here. So you can see, like... Is it this map here? Uh... No, it's not this map. Just a second. No problem. Um, while while Glauco's uh, setting this up, guys, um, I got I, I still have a handful of questions that I'm, I'm I see coming in has been up for a little bit. Um, I'm gonna let him try to get through most of this stuff, and then we'll we'll get back to some of the questions. So just to let you know that uh, I do see the questions, and uh, we're gonna get back to them uh, asap. Okay, cool. Sweet. All right. This That's one is awesome, I just man. had to kind of invert my the glass, right? Yeah. All right, and now we can tweak the intensity. I like to do something like between zero point zero fifteen to all the way up to zero point zero thirty or three. Okay. Well, we can we can tweak that later, but right. we can see like I'm only having speckler kind of more strong on the forehead and on the nose, and everything is kind of right. more matte. I'm gonna add like a second secondary reflection. This one is gonna be like more like a broad uh, reflection, so I'm gonna increase like decrease the glossiness to make like more like broad strokes to kind of. I don't I don't want this to be like super concentrated. Right. And then I'm gonna put like the intensity a little bit like here. Something like that. And now of course I need a normal map, so I'm gonna tweak that to detail normals. Now I have one extra slot here. So I'm gonna put my normal pad to normal. Right. And now you can see what I was talking, telling you guys before. You can see like how everything is kind of reflecting, if like all all the darker spots, like inside of inside of all my pores. So one way of removing that is using under the occlusion. Mm -hmm. You can put like oh, that's why I use a cavity map. Okay. Oh, okay, gotcha. To fix that area. And yeah, right. I'm gonna remove 
the diffuse. I don't want this to tweak the color, but I want I do want this to tweak the spectrum. Damn it. So you can see like how this is kind of. Oh wow, that is awesome. Remove. It. Yeah, and now I want to add like a detail normal. So I have it's just like a random noise. Oh okay, gotcha. Now you can see like this is this is like overlaying everything. Right. And I'm gonna tile this a lot. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna tile this a lot, just to kind of add this extra layer of sharpness and. Man, that is crazy. Break up to the whole like. So you, but but you know about this um, type of workflow, right? You know that you're going to be able to add this stuff later, right? So when you're when you're working on the high res sculpt, you know that your own pipeline is going to be able to do this later. So you're not worried about um, getting everything exactly perfect uh, in the very the very get go, right? So having like a, a full exactly. knowledge of all your tools, it becomes really really helpful, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And now, just for the sake of like our time, I can paint a mask just to kind of remove or kind of break up this detail normal, just to don't look like super exactly the same on all the areas. So let's say I want to remove like here and add mm -hmm. a little bit more here and there, just kind of so you can include that here. So detail weight map, um, that's where you're putting in? Yeah, it's more like a mask, yeah. Right. So oh, this is kind of looking okay, let's say. It's not good enough, but it's okay enough to continue. And now I'm gonna let me just decrease this brightness. So you can see, let me just tweak now the field of yield, something like 55. Cool. Millimeters. Portrait. You can see how this is starting to take shape. Like it's, I still have like some weirdness going on here and there, but it's starting to look more like skin. Right. Of, like, that. <laughs> yeah. And now we can tweak this a little bit more, and now. We can input the color map, which is head base color two. Oh man! And now, oh, the only thing that is bothering me is this glossiness map. I don't know which one I use in the end. Maybe this one. It's not this one. I can definitely paint a new one, but I don't think we have. Uh... Damn it. Yeah, let's just keep this one just for the just see you know. <clears throat> Have any questions or anything? Oh yeah, yeah, we got dude, we got tons of questions. Um let's see if we can find one for where we're at now. Um so in regards to color tones when this. using uh or doing mult malting style painting uh, what is the general rule of thumb as to where to use the colors? So, as face, talking about head, right? Right. Yeah. And, and that and uh, so usually... and how it uh, how it differs to the body. Uh, so it really comes down to paying attention to your own skin and how the colors are distributed. But of course, I can't give you like a rough skin. So the bottom part of the face is usually toned to green or blue mm -hmm. or even like gray. <laughs> this middle section here is more like red and like the upper part is more yellow. That happens because yellow usually it shows where we have more fat or bones. Red we usually shows where we have more skin uh, not skin, uh, more blood and muscles. And here, because of the stubble, that's pretty right. much it, because I have a lot, a lot of like pores and uh, hair strains. Right. 
So uh, same the same idea, I guess it would be for for the body, right? Like figure out where like a lot of your fat portions are. Figure out where you would see more of the blood flow, um, and then blue or green areas for um, any type of hair. One good exercise to do is just to uh, kind of open your hand, and then you can see all the colors here, right? So this there's a lot of red here. There's a lot of like green and yellow, and if you close the hand on like these areas, you can see how they change and like all the coloring kind of changes as well. Oh, no kidding, huh? And you can see like it's like personal reference. It's awesome. Like, yeah, yeah, how like they are all like more yellow, like where the bones to count. Like you can see how like lighting lighter it gets in some some areas. That's it. That's awesome. Uh, all right, I found the map. Sorry about that. And then <laughs> that's all right. Let's yeah. So it's called head, head reference. I don't know where is it. Right, this guy here. Yes. Okay. There we go. On it. Okay. <laughs> carry on. Carry on. No, 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 carry on. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna just turn this to black, so you guys can see. All right. This oh is man, that was awesome. Sorry about that. That it was. You know, as as ugly as that dude is, he sure is sexy. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Cool. Now we have like the final map tuning. Let's just keep it down a little bit. Let's go back to our final color, and you can see like how the speckler and the glossiness kind of adds more volume to the head as well, and starts to kind of look more real, more like skin. Absolutely. And. We can now tweak the normal a little bit. So I want the normal and like all the pore information to kind of show through my speckler instead of like showing through my model. What I mean is if I keep this like super sharp, you can see, I don't, I'm not sure if you guys can see that, but you can still see some of like my pores here and there, but I kind of want these them to look a little bit smooth but only kind of show through like the spec letter mm. where the speckler kind of hits. Subtlety, subtlety, right? Mm -hmm. Subtlety. Yeah. Yeah. Super subtle. Now I can play with my, uh, with my HDRI. Let's grab something like this guy. I'm gonna tone this down a little bit. Just to kind of add a little bit more color, you can see like some highlights and like some green lights. Mm -hmm. And then I'm gonna change this color. Just change this to black, just for the sake of you guys being able to see what I'm doing easier. So normally for um for lighting setup in Marmoset, you usually mostly just do like a two light setup. No, I have like probably usually like a three or four light setup. Okay. But it, it also depends. Sometimes I attach them to my sky so that I can show you. So if I just grab all of them and put under my sky, whenever I I I rotate Holy my sky, cow. they kind of rotate as well. I totally don't, didn't so know is, that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so this is a, a really good way to, uh, once you are, you kind of, all right, this is cool, this is, this is 
what I want for the final look, you can yeah. attach them and then you can rotate. So you get like oh. different lighting schemes without, because what I tend to do, I always tend to put like a, the, the standard three light setup, right. or like the two lights, one on, on each side. Mm -hmm. When you do that, you kind of create all these crazy lightings that you don't usually do. Right. Like this one, for example, I kind of like it better than the one I was doing. Then also like this one. Right, and that's also a good way to make sure that it looks good in, in all rotations, right? Not just the, the single light setup that you have set up in there, right? Exactly, exactly. You can also click on the sky, and then you can click here to add like another light. What? And then it's also, yeah, it's also creating another light under the sky. So when you rotate, it's rotating this light as well. <laughs> that's awesome. But I find kind of super tricky to use this. Yeah. Because I'm not sure where the light is. Does this show you in the viewport at all? If you if you zoom out, or does it only exist on your light map on your sky map there? No, this one. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, it. Uh, oh, it does create one. Okay. Uh, direction. Directional. Yeah. And I don't like working with directions that much because of the harsh shadows. Yeah. And, yeah. So uh, another thing that they introduced uh, on the previous version, you can tweak the shape of the light, which will affect not only the shadows, but also the spec work. So let's see. You can see how you can. Can you see like here how it's affecting not only oh, the yeah. shadows, but also like my specular. What? That's just a omni light. Omni light, but you can see now. Yeah. It's more like a rectangular light. Oh my god! So that's you can kind of do some really crazy setups that you would do in theory with like all these box shaped yeah. lights and soft shadow box. But just for the sake of the presentation, I'm going to keep this like that. Hey, if you guys were wanna... wondering at all, or thinking about getting to uh, Marmoset, or wondering if it was relevant or not, this Marmoset is very, very relevant. Very relevant, and very, very powerful if you use it in, uh, in the right ways. That's freaking crazy. I don't like spending a lot of, like I said, I don't have an, a lot of free time, and I'm not super good at rendering. I don't have, like, a crazy machine either. Mm -hmm. So I really love Marmoset and the ability to show what I want to do. Yeah. And what I want to show in like super easy way and just like on the fly you can tweak the lights and tweak your maps and everything and you get the results <laughs> out of, uh, like right away. Of course, it's good, but it's not good enough like a rendering so we cannot compare results right right but if we are talking about real time you know, like rendering i think this is close enough to an engine yeah it looks a pretty little close. bit stronger than an engine in some times right yeah, um but it's close, so just to let you guys know um uh Gawko has to take off just a little bit early today uh so we have to cut it at about 2 30 to 25 to 20 something like that so um we're going to try to get as much out of him uh in the time that we still have so uh if uh so is are you um you got more skin st uh stuff to show in marmoset or is that pretty much it uh i was going to show how i set up the ice but if okay we are, what time is it two ten? yeah two what, ten. Do we... you have something else that you want to talk about I yeah we got uh we got a fistful of there. questions um that we can probably just go through real quick um a lot of people are interested in in yeah, sure. some of your um some of your feedback. Um, so, general poly count limit for some of like the more main characters uh, in uh, the game, like the actual game character. What's a, a general, like PS4, uh, poly count limit for a main character? Uh, I think it will depend on the company and on the project you are working on. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I would say, and also, so it, it's it gets tricky because. People always think about, nowadays we have a lot of tools to do all the lots, the, the LOD. Right, so LOD. Usually when we speak about poly count, we are speaking the poly count that we do, the initial model. But it's not always that what you see on screen is the lot zero, mm -hmm. right? So if it's lot one, it's already like 
not decimated, but it's already like lower and then it's already loading. I would say for lot zero, it's it's around 80 to 90,000 for like a main character. Got So uh, around 80,000 you said? Yeah. Right, 80,000. Okay. Got it can it. be and, more, it can be less than that. And that's, uh, is that tries or polys? I think it cut out. Uh, was it tries or polys? Sorry. Tries. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I think, I think uh, that's tries. awesome. Okay, so uh, <laughs> that was awesome. Um, okay, so like about eight thousand tries. So about this is, uh, let me just put this straight. This this can change a lot, and I don't think people would should uh, focus on that too much if you are trying to land a gig on a triple A studio and working with like PlayStation Four. Yeah. Like the technology has been evolving so much that the poly count it's not the limit anymore. What is limiting us? It's more on the texture resolution right. and like secondary stuff. So just make sure you're doing this. Make look 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 is make it look good enough, and also have like a good topology so riggers can animate that. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it. Don't okay. if you are trying to do triple A stuff. Right, right. So focus more on on your actual textures and your texture sets and uh, the type of uh, poly flow and and not necessarily the poly count. Yeah. Got it. Cool. That makes a lot. Of, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so like time time wise, so a lot of people are like really curious, obviously, and you get this a lot, I'm sure, is like how long does this this type of character like. How long do you usually get in um, in studio to to complete at least version one of a character like this? Yeah, this is really hard too, and it depends on the character, depends on the model, depends on the project, depends on the concept team. I would say I would roughly say around one month to one month and a half for like a full character, mm. but it can be less. It can be way more than that. Right. Uh, it all depends on on how many revisions you have on all kinds of different stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. All right. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, I probably sorry. Uh, we have uh, people asking about hair. That's my wife. Hey, wife. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Say hello <laughs> to uh, Mrs. Longi. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the, she's up, the uh, the source behind the madness. Yep. Um. So yeah. let's see what else we got here. Um, so for the low poly, did you just export out decimated or ZRMS versions from ZBrush for this guy? I, I did both. Some parts I did a total, total with Topo and Maya. Mm. Some parts are decimated in ZBrush, and some parts since I built in Maya first, I already had like good topology. Gotcha. So it's a mix, a mix of different things. It really depends on. Yeah. The actual piece, right? So it may be easier to do um, like your buttons or something in Maya instead of actually creating them in ZBrush. So it's kind of like um, a lot of people think that your final, final high res mesh uh, or sculpt will be in ZBrush when actuality, like there is no one shot of your complete final high res because you're using a, a mix between doing something in in a core program versus doing it in uh zbrush or, or so on and so forth right mm -hmm. gotcha um uh, let's see we get we got um so we got about uh maybe like 10 minutes or so and then um we'll try it we'll try to get you out of here um so unfortunately i don't think we'll have time to do hair stuff today fortunately no, yeah yeah that means I mean, well, you could whip out hair in like I don't know five minutes, right? Just game ready hair from from nothing to game ready hair. Five minutes. That's totally that's enough time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I do it. <laughs> You're just uh, you should use the hairbrush, right? It just makes hair yeah, for you. Just use the hairbrush, hair shader, and that's that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you just just hit the button and it puts it right in. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um. So. Yeah. Uh, somebody was asking about skin again. So just to, just to cover your workflow for for skin details, you use you do a lot of the sculpting and pore detail in ZBrush, and then you um, do more stuff. As kind much of as I can. And, yeah. 
Right. And then you I, use I some... Do, I do as much as I, I can, but also having in mind the texture resolution. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what happens, people put so much detail in the ZBrush scene, and they have like a really small or like a low budget texture resolution. And in the end, it all looks like super noisy. Mm -hmm. So just having mine and do some tests early to see what is going to look good on, on a budget you have. Right. So um, we have uh, we have some questions about like skin shaders and stuff too, like for for the the details. Um, like how? So mm -hmm. I know that like in in larger uh, studios you have specific texture artists that do a lot of the texture work. Like where? So where do you um, like hand off some of that stuff to? Um, texture people do they do they usually do stuff on characters or are you ma ma mainly responsible for everything no. yeah as far as the uncharted for all mm. the character team we all did everything we had Abing, uh Abing young she's mm -hmm. the shader artist so she was mainly focused on doing all and creating all the shaders and setting up all the materials mm -hmm. and creating like all these kind of presets for us so it's pretty much like she created like super complex stuff and made it look easy. Like, yeah, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes when I tweak the subdermis here, right. the set, for example. Uh -huh. And this is kind of the same thing that we had. So of course she was always there and she's amazing. She was always yeah. trying to help us out, but it was like on our hands to create all the textures and like everything. But we do we did get access to a lot of uh, like detail normals and all these tieable textures to add on top of our models. Right. And then we would input masks to break them up and stuff. Pretty much like like what we have in marmosets sets is like way simple, but it's it you can estimate it's just like a rough estimate of what we have. Gotcha. So it's more like, so the texture artists more just kind of make the tools for you and then you put them to work, right? Yeah, she's like a shader artist. She's not like a texture artist. Right. So and you I don't just hand her like a gray box and just be like, okay, make my stuff look awesome. <laughs> you still got to do it, right? <laughs> no, no, yeah. I know, I know some studios do that. There are some studios that they have only texture artists Yeah. Uh, as far as character go. But in our case, all the character artists was in charge of doing all the textures too. Right, right. That's awesome, awesome stuff. Um, da, 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 let's see what else we got here. Uh, we get a covered poly count. Um, so we talked about the lights and marmoset that you use. Yeah. Um, do you um, do you use camera effects at all when you're setting up like your final renders in marmoset? No. Okay. No, I do not use it. I can show just, just I don't I won't be have time to do the eyes, but yeah. I think the eyes are like super important. Yep. So I just wanna kinda go through Oh actually I'm using uh DOF here. Depth of field, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> That's freaking awesome. Just change this to a few. All right, let me just try to hide some stuff. Okay. This is, these are the eyes. Yeah, wish wish we could have you for like another eighteen hours, man. We suck the the information out of that cool. brain of yours. <laughs> All right, let me just open this again. It's like super slow. It's okay. Like lagging. Okay, uh, while, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll um, grab a couple uh, more questions here real quick. Yeah, sure. Uh, are you planning on teaching any classes at all anytime soon? Um, we have a lot of people that really would love to uh, pick your brain on a lot of this stuff. 
Yes, I do. Just stay uh, tuned. Uh, keep in touch and stay. <laughs> yeah, just keep watching. Okay, good. All right, well, um, we'll keep we'll be keeping an eye out for anything uh, on you're doing in the future. We got a lot of people interested in learning more for me for sure. All right, just go over through okay. my AI setup. I have like one mesh. I'm gonna de like delete the mesh so you can see. I have like a outside mesh for the eye. I okay. just delete it. Uh, now I, I also have like an inside mesh for the eye. You can see that this is kind of. Uh, yeah, modeled in there. This is why a frame. Yes. Well, let me just try to hide at least. Mass here. It's just I wasn't like super prepared for this. Yeah, it's okay. It's all right. We're putting you on the spot sometimes too, so. Well, you guys are getting a look at these hair cards there while you're at it. Yeah. Are those nose hair cards? Yes. Yeah! That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's just like some small details yes. like here and there. <laughs> Actually, just, let me just get rid of all the hair so it's going to yeah. be way faster. All right. All right. All right, now that's easy. I can't show. All right, so just put the eye eyes back here all right so like I was saying okay now it's easier like I was saying I have two meshes for the eyes so you can see like an outside mesh right and it's very simple it's like a lot of people do this way right but one thing that I do I have this normal map on the outside, so it's kind of adding some breakup. A little specularity um, breakup? Like this part. Yeah. Yeah. And then when I put the head, of course, like, oh, my uh, my ambient occlusion is going to be different, so it's, it's not that red. Another thing that I do, so for the outside part, I can show you the shader real quickly. I have... Like a simple foam shader, more like a, a reflection shader. So I'm using like an alpha, just like turn it on. Okay. And then I have like two different setups for this, the the reflection. I have like a GGX one. Just I was just playing with like the, the different ways, the different kind of reflections they have. The sure. GGX. Right. It's not like 100% accurate for this model, but let's right. just keep moving forward. I just like, just play with the fat loser for you. And then here as well. So I have one for this part and then the inside part, I put like a skin. Uh, oh yeah. So I put like a skin shader for the eyes to okay. be able to tweak the shadows. So you can see like here how bad right. the shadows look. Right. And then I can smooth the shadows, like blur the shadows a little bit, and they look like more soft and more real. And oh, then cool. I do have another mesh for the inside part of, of the eyes. And right. I try to turn that on. And I'll, I also have some the... like a lacrimo. Uh, yeah, there's like a specific name for it. I don't for, know. for like the yeah. wetness of the eye, right? Uh, it's more. Yeah, yeah, it's more like in the wetness, like some kind of tear. Uh, yeah, just to kind of helping out to make this look alive when you have like some some light, some lighting kind of hitting from the side, and and then I have. Let me see if I can. Try to find that. 
Yeah, that's it's kind of normal too. Like when when you get in this close to see um, some of the things that you would never see from regular distance, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I just saw one question: if I place the hair cards manually, yes. Gotcha. I do place them one by one manually. There's, I haven't seen any more effective way of doing that yet. Then place on the cards manually. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, that that's pretty much it that I what I wanted to show. That's awesome, man. Yeah, Actually, it's definitely I to do from scratch. Yeah. Go ahead. A little bit more time than I planned. Yeah, dude, that, it, it's really cool to see um, that you know it. All the work is not just done when you're you know when you're done with Painter, um, like the work's not done, right? You want to set up like all of your. Um, th there's a ton that you can do in Marmoset uh, for all the rendering and everything. Um, yeah, and it, it's definitely awesome. Yeah, I think I can relate. To... Sorry, no, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say it's awesome to see like somebody actually breaking down how they set up their scene in Marmoset. And like you said, a lot of people really aren't, don't really cover that. So I think it, it really adds a lot uh, to be able to see how you set some of this stuff up, man. That's cool. Yeah, it's all about presentation in the end. So yeah. when I was doing traditional sculpture, you can do like a beautiful sculpture, but if you don't take like a proper photograph, right. or at least like put some, like a good photograph, it doesn't show what you did, right? So I think here is the same. Even like just doing like a ZBrush scope, if you don't render that out or if you don't present them well, mm -hmm. it doesn't look, it won't look that good, right? So you kinda, you're kind of wasting all your time. So this model looks cool in Substance Painter, but once I add all the shaders and like all the materials and all the lighting, of course, that adds so much that people get interested in seeing like all all the extra details and all the effort I put into, into it. Right. It may it makes all the difference if you so, can if you can like show some of the yeah. the extra end end work stuff. You know, there's a, and that's what's awesome about about this is that you know we we have a a lot of resources when it comes down to showing people showing them how you do the sculpt, how you do you know exporting, how you do painter stuff. But um, it's it's really awesome to see um, the final kind of putting everything together and um, putting the finishing touches on it and because presentation is so so important you know it it's a make or break kind of thing so being able to to see how you do it and show like how much um, uh, love goes into the presentation side of it um, is, is huge you know just to you know, we were talking about times right yeah. so on this presentation, for example, just the lighting, I probably spent like a week just tweaking you know, all the lighting because it gets to a point that you tweak the light and you don't see any difference. But if, if you kind of step back away from it and let it sit and then on the, on the next day you open the file and then you see all the lighting, say like, nah, that's not good. And right. it, it gets super dirty if you start adding a lot of lights it can get super dirty, right. like super easy. And lighting is tricky, man. It's it's not easy, at <laughs> least for me. So I like to spend a lot of time and do maybe three or four lighting setups that I like. And then on the end, I kind of pick the ones I, I like the most. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, um, I know we got to uh, probably got to wrap it up. You got to you got to start taking off. Um, yeah. It was uh, it was fan freaking tastic yeah. uh, having you on, man. And um, I, you know, I, I wish I wish we could spend another twenty hours with you. Um, <laughs> it's it's been a really uh, uh, an awesome. Yeah, it was a blast. I had a blast. It was it was cool. Yeah, dude. it's always good to show and kind of share my experiences. And I'm glad I can help a little bit people who's starting out. And I saw someone mentioning about mentorship. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll definitely start doing some mentorship in the future. I have like a lot of projects involving that. I just don't want to talk about anything specific yeah. so far. 
but it's uh, on it's on your mind. Me. That's the important thing. It is, dude. Sign me up, dude. Sign me up. <laughs> it is. Absolutely, I man. Mean. Cool. Well, um, thank you very much, dude, for being here, man. I really, really appreciate you taking your time to um, to show us some of your work, and and I think we're all kind of got some really, really good tips and tricks, and is really good to see uh, how you broke some of this stuff down. And we really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day to uh, to be here. Yeah, sure, man. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys, for stopping by. To sorry for uh the mess on some of these files i wasn't like fully prepared for this presentation but I i'm glad i'm pretty sure you guys learned something and absolutely just stay tuned for more stuff and see you guys in the future absolutely man and um if you feel so inclined um the uh invite is always open if you want to go round two any anytime you're ready man anytime you're ready <laughs> Thank you, man. thanks Awesome, Thanks, guys. Man. I like the stuff that you're doing and keep up the channel and keep it up doing like everything you're doing. I think you're doing great stuff. And Thanks for the invite. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Oh, and, man. Appreciate that. Yeah, that's it, man. Awesome, man. Well, it's, it's, been, it's been our pleasure, dude. So um, say hi to the wife for us. Uh, tell her thank you for uh, letting us steal you for a couple hours. And um, we will uh, we'll see everybody soon. We're going to get this um, this replay hopefully up. I'm going to try to get it up tonight um, on YouTube, um, if not, uh, probably tomorrow or the next day. So um, keep an eye out on uh, Facebook for the link on that. And Glocko, thanks again, man. Much, much appreciated. Sure, man. All right, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, man. All right. All right. See you guys later. All right, guys. Bye -bye. Later.